major support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I'm your host, Lauren Seiler. My wife, Arlene, could not be here today. Um, with us to discuss a very important issue of Team 2 is Washington County Mental Health. Uh, Kristen Chandler uh, and uh, Tony Fakus, the, um, the Chief of Police of Montpelier Police Department. Uh, but before we get to them, we would just like to say um, thank you to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services. Uh, welcome to Able Then On Air. And thank, thank you, you thank very you much. Having us. Uh, thank you having us, yes. Tell us what Team 2 is and the missions and goals of Team 2. Sure. Um, Team 2 is a training program for, it's run statewide for, um, started off for, for first responders, for police, law enforcement, and mental health crisis workers. Mm -hmm. And it has sort of evolved in the last um, five years mm -hmm. that it's been in existence to um, a training for lots of different first responders. It's a one-day training mm -hmm. um, in teaching people how to respond collaboratively to mental health crises. When we say respond collaboratively, give us an example of what that means. So that means that what what we hope would happen is if an officer got a call out and knew that there was some type of mental health component to that call and that officer felt like they could probably use some help from somebody with expertise in mental health that they would then reach out to their local mental health agency mm -hmm. and those folks should be mobile and able to respond with the officer to the scene mm -hmm. or if they can't respond to the scene to at least provide some kind of assistance that's how it started as, and that's why it's called Team 2, is it initially started as just law enforcement officers and mental health crisis clinicians mm -hmm. training together in this one-day training. Uh, Chief, when we talk about breaking barriers, because we, we, with this show today, we want to kind of break barriers. And um, What has been your experience with Team 2, and how did you come um, to be part of it? Um, well, it was uh, then com uh, Commissioner Mary Moulton's idea to come up with this, this, this Team 2 type program. And I got to say it was a really interesting journey for me. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, being a career Montpelier police officer, and I started working in the city since 1985, we always had Washington County mental health. They were always just a seamless partner to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked very closely with them. So when I got involved in the law enforcement uh, side of being part of this Team 2 collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, building it out, it was, I realized how much I, you know, taken certain relationships for granted in terms of Washington County Mental Health. When I started uh, going around, when we started doing Train the Trainers in other parts of the state of Vermont, that that type of relationship, that resource wasn't always available to, to a trooper or a, a deputy sheriff or a police officer in a, a variety of areas. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was very sobering to me that, you know, what, what happens in these communities when they don't have you know, that mobile clinician that can come out uh, and work with somebody, um, you know, that is in crisis or has, uh, you know, just needs, just, just sometimes it's just that, that human checkup. How you doing? Um, it is so vital. And I got to say, I want to just say that the chief was somebody who Mary Moulton identified really early on mm -hmm. as yeah, we definitely what need she to called her. Um, mm -hmm. a champion, okay. meaning that he got he got it. He got that police, when they respond to people in a mental health crisis, that they've got to take a different tactic. Mm -hmm. They've got to take a different tone and a different stance. And mm -hmm. Chief Fekos understood that. And so he was part of the original uh, Team 2 steering committee that helped form the curriculum mm -hmm. along with uh, lots of other folks, but he was really instrumental to that. Now, we say mental health, but I mean, okay, let's do a what if here. Does Team 2 or can Team 2 help someone with uh, who is mentally and physically challenged if the case presents itself? Sure. The way the training works is um, now we go to five different regions around the state and we invite as uh, attendees people from um, mental health agencies who work in both uh, mental health crisis response and in intellectual disability response. And sometimes there are other folks who might be working with 
people with a physical disability who might also attend the training. But that's not our primary focus. It's mm -hmm. definitely uh, people in either a mental health crisis or an intellectual disability crisis. Describe, uh, without mentioning names, uh, a, me a mental health crisis. How would you guys really go into a situation? Do you want, do you yeah. want to take yeah. that? If you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, all too often, uh, those calls will come right to the police department or police agency to respond because somebody's behavior is uh, very much out of the norm where they might be dangerous uh, to themselves or others. Hurting and somebody else. Hurt, you know, or potentially, you know. And, um, and so the way Team 2 works, uh, but we, al we also we are going to put a call into Washington County Mental Health, which is our designated agency in Montpelier. And the, the police are really there just f first and foremost to establish a safety. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as practical, the whole goal of Team 2 is, okay, police are there, um, and maybe it's not as bad as you know, a caller uh, you know, said it was, or, or the person is already starting to calm down. The sooner that we can just you know, uh, remove ourselves, the police, from that call, and, and, and introduce you know, the clinician to really help provide that level of support and, and even treatment if need be, um, that's really then their role. And, and we just are there to facilitate whatever may need to happen, whether it could be a transport to the hospital, um, or maybe we're not needed at all at that point. Um, as opposed to just law enforcement going to the scene, what do we have here? It, um, mm -hmm. you know, so we, ultimately we want to make sure that if, if, the, if, the, if the conduct um, that, you know, the, uh, that the person is presenting, um, you know, do they, ultimately, you know, what, is, what do they need? Why are they doing that and how do we best help them? Mm -hmm. uh, just arresting somebody because it's disorderly conduct, for example, is that really gonna get us the best outcome, the right or outcome? Or putting the cuffs on somebody might, probably might yeah, we, scare right, them right, even exactly. more. We don't wanna escalate it. Um, but again, we have to do what we have to do to make sure the scene is safe. Um, but ideally, again, as soon as we are no longer that safety piece, uh, you know, that, that, that concern is no longer there, uh, it's safe. Um, we have that clinician right there to have that, you know, to really start supporting that person. So what's the difference between um, the clinician or a clinician that goes into a scene and the screener, or is there different, is the screener I'm using well? them inter in, yeah, yeah. interchangeably. Yeah, we use that interchangeably. <laughs> there are technically differences, but for our purposes today, it's t somebody from the local mental health agency mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. would be, you could call them a screener, you could call them a yeah. clinician, you could call them a crisis worker, you know. Um, there are a few police agencies around the state, including a couple barracks of the Vermont State Police that have what they are calling an embedded worker. And that's somebody who is employed by the mental health agency, but they actually sit with the local police. And I believe Montpelier and Barry is we are, starting We are right now um, working with uh, Washington County Mental Health, Barry City Police, mm -hmm. Montpelier Police. Oh, you guys work together between Well, we're trying, Barry, we're trying Barry to City establish and... funding right now uh -huh. uh, with legislative support uh, for an embedded uh, mental health worker for the two departments that we would share. Yeah. Um, and because that model really works it, yeah. uh, really well. And not just, does that, that model has proven to work in large jurisdictions other parts of the country as well. This isn't, that part's not unique to Vermont. The challenge is, you know, can and how will Vermont fund it? And that's really where we're at. So right team now. two, right now, team two is just Vermont. But you, what you're trying to do is bring it nationally, or bring well, it. Well, team two is it's really uh, <clears throat> unique to Vermont, mm -hmm. um, and it is a great collaboration between the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety. Mm -hmm. So the Vermont State Police basically, and the Department of Mental Health have a it's a year-to-year grant-funded position uh, or program. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, this fall, we've gone um, all over the country um, letting other people know about this model. We've been invited to speak at various, various conferences. And in fact, the chief and I and Mary Moulton went to the International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference mm -hmm. in Chicago um, in October mm -hmm. to present uh, what we're doing here in Vermont. And we were the only, um, the only state where we're doing this type of training where we bring those folks together for one day so that they can all learn each other's language, understand each other's limitations, and build those relationships that are really necessary that Tony's talked about um, 
for when, when you're in a crisis, you want to already have that relationship established rather than trying to figure out who everybody is. So we've been recognized um, internationally, really, um, for this uh, model that we've put on here in Vermont um, for the last five years. And it's just, uh, it, there's been a great response from law enforcement. Vermont State Police have identified Team 2 as a priority to put all their troopers through the mm -hmm. training. So uh, they're doing that. Now, before Team 2, there was nothing else well, in its place? The, or? the mandatory training that all law enforcement officers get in Vermont is um, what, it's an eight-hour training. It's mandated by statute. And that's for, it's called interacting with persons uh, in a mental health crisis. Or some people refer to it as Act 80 training. Mm -hmm. And I teach that at the police academy along with a law enforcement officer and uh, a clinician. Um, and that's, e every single officer in the state who wants to be certified has to go through that. So that is what is required. And that is in what we call it, it's like a 100 level course. It's like basic uh, mental health 101. Mm -hmm. And then team two would be like a 200 level course. It's sort of like first aid for mental health? Or mental health it? first aid is a different, that's okay. a different program. Okay, um, yeah. That focuses on different things other than that, that Act 80 doesn't, doesn't focus on. Okay. And then the other training that is available is uh, crisis intervention training or CIT that's a 40-hour training, and there's one police agency in Vermont that does that, and that's the Hartford Police Department. That takes five, day, five days in a row, um, which is what a lot of smaller agencies really can't afford to send an officer to a training for, fi for an entire week. And mm -hmm. that's why uh, Team 2 kind of fits nicely for a rural state and a rural jurisdictions because it's a, it's a lot easier to send an officer t to a one-day training as opposed to a five-day training. Okay. Talk about some of these presentations and the import, re the real importance, you know, you know, behind having this important training. Uh, well, as Kristen mentioned, it's it's so much about relationships. So it's a scenario, it's a tabletop scenario-based training model. So uh, so it puts again uh, the screen or the or the clinician. Uh, you know, they're they're talking about well what they would do, what's their responsibility, their role at this phase of this situation. Mm -hmm. And then police will talk about what their response would look like. And it's a chance to really start understanding, you know, um, what other, how each see their responsibilities, but then they start working together. Because when you're at a scene uh, of some, you know, and somebody's in crisis, and it, sometimes they're very, 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 you know, can be very volatile, very dangerous. Uh, um, yelling, screaming, even worse than that? E even worse than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be weapons involved. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's not the first time you want to meet that, your partner, if you will, um, from, from that designated agency. And, um, you know, one of my, one of my roles, uh, you know, back when I was a sergeant uh, and uh, even um, uh, was a, being a crisis negotiator in the department, we have, uh, mm -hmm. we now have three operational crisis hostage negotiators. Even, even with having a negotiator, a trained negotiator, and that's a whole different level of training, to have a training, um, it's still important to have uh, even when I negotiated, if I had, I, it was important for me to have uh, that screener from Washington County Mental Health kind of backing me up, or if I, you know, or maybe they could do a better job than I'm doing in a certain situation. Or maybe they can get information that would yeah. be helpful to, for the police to use right. in order to try to negotiate with someone. Yeah. And that's why that collaboration is so key. Yeah. And as the chief mentioned, um, the training itself, it's a scenario-based training. So we work through, in that one day, they get uh, three different scenarios to work through in small groups. So you have a mix of people. Um, dispatchers are also uh, invited to training and, and attend. So we've got law enforcement, mental health folks. You've got dispatchers. Uh, sometimes we've got EMTs coming as well. Um, and sometimes a disability uh, or uh, the folks from the DS side of things might also be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's just a great way, as, as the chief said, for them to learn from each other about, OK, this is what I've got to do. And what we really focus on in that conversation is the legal, the clinical, and the safety aspects of each of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. So everybody's bringing something to the table. And before the, 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 during the day, before they do any scenarios, they first hear, for about an hour and a half, they get uh, from me a, a legal overview of the mental health laws, uh, any updates and what's legal, going on. I'm sorry, when you say legal overview, 
Mm -hmm. Explain what that means. Well, um, I was an assistant attorney general with the Department of Mental Health for eight years. Yes. Um, and prior to that, I was a prosecutor. And so I, I work a lot in the criminal system. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I did, uh, I tried cases here in Vermont uh, for involuntary commitment. We talk a lot about that process, about we spend a lot of time on mental health warrants mm -hmm. um, and who they apply to and who they don't apply to and what the, what the limitations of the law are. And so the group gets an overview of any changes in the law, um, anything that they I feel like they should know about. But we usually spend a lot of time talking about mental health warrants because it continues to be uh, a little bit of a mystery for lots of people. So is it hard, I mean, uh, you can also answer this as well. So is it hard to get, because uh, I understand the process of getting a warrant, but is it harder to get a mental health warrant? Why or why not? Uh, I wouldn't say it's harder, uh, but it's, it's the, in Vermont, the law says that there's only two people who can write one, and that's either a qualified mental health professional uh -huh. or a law enforcement officer. And so those are the people who are in the room, so we want to talk about Well, what who if the relative says, you must do something, you know, can they override or help override a situation? They can't. The law says wow. um, the person has to meet the legal standard, which is they've got to be a person in need of treatment. So that first of all, they have to have a major mental illness. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, as a result of that illness, they are a danger to themselves or others. And that can look a lot of different ways. And that's something that where that mental health person and the off officer can exchange information that the mental health folks may know about a pattern of um, things that have happened in the past or they may know about that they're actually in, currently in treatment and this is just a, a, a little slip. You know, it, they're just this great exchange of information if they're working together. Um, and so, and then there's no, uh, they can also decide which one of us is gonna write the warrant and how, how this is gonna go if it comes to needing to write a warrant. And that's usually the very last so they'll go to a, thing they wanna uh, do. They'll go to a treatment program, not a jail or Correct. They'll oh, go to a hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 They're going to a hospital. Hospital. Because we want to. We want to get them some help. Yeah. And yeah. the mental health warrant is that's what it's for is to get somebody to a doctor who doesn't want to go. It's really a, it's a way to to get take them there against their will involuntarily, but a judge has weighed in and said you know this is this is what needs to happen in order to keep this person safe. Safe and without healthy. hurting someone else. Or themselves. Or themselves. Yeah. 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 And that's you know, and that's a really important piece. What you kind of talked about is so much. So much of why we have Team Two do all the things that we're doing is that we're really trying to again provide the most appropriate outcome, and 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 whatever you know possible. And the right thing to do is we're trying to keep people out of out of the criminal system, and 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 get them again to a treatment oriented. And that that even includes a philosophy even with addiction as we're dealing with that as well. And many times too, those are two co-occurring problems. Mm -hmm. um, and and ultimately. That's how you know we're all trying to best serve Vermonters. Um, is that getting them the help that they need, and not just putting them in the, you know um, you know sometimes sometimes uh, certain conduct is criminal and, and it needs to be dealt with that way. But generally speaking, explain, explain what do you mean by well if you conduct. commit if you commit a violent crime, we yeah. still have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, but um, but it but, doesn't prohibit us from also right. trying to get you some yeah. help at the same time. Yeah. You can be in those. You can be in right. both systems at once, right. if you, if need be. Mm -hmm. But our go-to is not just to get them in front of a judge because of a criminal citation for, you know, uh, you know, a misdemeanor offense or something like that. Now, now, what I mean before the mental health warrant, or, um, let's say, if you have Team Two in a situation, and say, and then the person says, "Okay, I need some help." Mm -hmm. um, do you take them to a hospital first, or can the person sign their own paperwork without other no people? No paperwork really needed. If they say they want to go voluntarily, yes. Yeah. Um, the only issue then is how are you going to how are we going to get you there? You're either going to get a, get a ride with your family, or can you get yourself there? Are you safe enough to get yourself there, or can we help you somehow and give you a ride? So yeah. it's really there's not really paperwork involved if somebody wants to go voluntarily until they actually get to the hospital. Yeah. Um, yep. Or psychi well, is it a hospital or is it, is it a psychiatric facility, or both? 
Well, it's going to depend on the situation, what their oh. needs are. Okay. But that's something that that clinician or the screener is going to help determine, is what is the least restrictive right. method available to actually help this person and keep them safe. Okay. Now, you mentioned legal. Mm -hmm. Can you go through the other, some of the other parts, parts of, of the curriculum? Yes. Sure. Um, so besides the legal overview, we do uh, the three scenarios. We also have a piece, um, uh, show a short film on working with individuals on the autism spectrum, just because those calls have really increased in the last couple Badly. of years. Mm -hmm. yep. um, we have a panel presentation that's a really key part of the day where somebody with lived experience comes in and we also have a law enforcement officer and a, a mental health clinician that sit on a panel and they just tell another, they talk about something that either worked really well um, in the past for them or something that didn't work well. And there's usually um, really very positive response to getting to hear from somebody with lived experience who is now in a position where they're, they're well enough that they can actually reflect on and give some great advice to the law enforcement officers really about, you know, this really worked well for me. You know, just be aware that uh, if you're yelling a lot of commands at me at once, it's going to be hard or whatever it might have been their experience. It's just helpful to hear from somebody who's actually been through it. And then um, we do a resources piece. So it's another part of going around the state is there are different resources available in different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. So we talk about what do you use in this part, in this part of the state. Um, so let's say we're down in the southwest region. So that's uh, Bennington County, um, Rutland County, uh, and we actually include Addison County in that. But uh, we might say, you know, what, what do you do here if, you need, if somebody needs a ride or they need uh, shelter, they're homeless, or if they need um, uh, some kind of substance abuse addiction treatment, like what do you have in this area? What do you, what do you use? What's available 24-7 and what isn't? And it's, it's different everywhere. So that's why we really encourage people to attend in their region where they work. Um, people can't always do that, but it's really, it's a much richer conversation when, you, when they're, you know, attending a, a training mm -hmm. in their own region. And they're also then working with people at the training who they might then see out in the field in the future. Now, what if, let's just say, you go into a situation uh, in this, you know, lots of situations. You know, you said that some work and some don't, or vice versa. What happens if you go into a situation and it doesn't work? Um, do you, I mean, obviously you're trying to talk the person down or you're right. trying to um, speak to them in a manner that they can understand. Um, how long do some of those situations, can they last hours? So, sort of like a, a, host, a, a negotiator or? Sometimes they absolutely can last hours. Um, and, you know, and usually if it's something that's, that's lasting hours, there's usually a dangerous, pretty dangerous component to that. Yeah. Um, uh, and in some cases we're already involving uh, a psychiatrist, you know, so there's, again, working, thinking about the, the, the mental health warrant piece, but also what's the safety planning around how we're eventually going to make sure that this 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 um, has a uh, you know the best out outcome that we can help facilitate, mm -hmm. um, but they're all they're all they're, each one's a little different. Um, but certainly even at the uh, that that baseline training, they talk about it, you know for, for the police training, it's just trying to slow things down, um, having one person, you know, just trying to communicate, um, and and sometimes too that's whoever has that rapport. I mean we've had situations where. We have a trained negotiator on scene. We've got mental health uh, screener standing outside of a scene that's very uh, dangerous. But we've got another officer that has a rapport with this person and is talking. Well, we're just because the other, just because there's a negotiator on scene, we'll keep that other person, you know, in play, if you will, that other officer, or it could be a screener. You know, whatever's working. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to upset that rhythm, and that's really important. Um, so, but each case is, uh, you know, we we only have so many tools. Mm -hmm. if you will, and options. And so much resources, like you said. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we also, in those scenarios that we, the three scenarios, every year they're different, but the, we try to incorporate as many different types of issues in those scenarios that somebody might see. So we usually have a scenario that involves a, a child or a, a kid. 
Uh, we try to have a scenario that involves somebody with a uh, developmental disability or an intellectual disability. Um, just so, again, people can learn, like, what's children, different about that? If it involves kids, would seem to, it, it's a different thing, right? Well, the law is the same um, as far as uh, involuntarily committing children, but it might involve a different team. It, depending on what part of the state you're in, some mental health agencies have different people who would respond if there was a child in crisis. Mm -hmm. It also involves completely different resources, and as you might know... But how is the law the same with a child? Uh, it's the same exact uh, law regarding involuntary commitment. They still have to be uh, a person in need of treatment before um, they can be committed against their will, mm -hmm. and regardless of what their parents might want. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but meanwhile, we only have one hospital in the state where kids can go if they need that level of care, and that's the Brattleboro Retreat. Mm -hmm. So um, scenarios also usually include, try to include uh, somebody who might be a veteran or somebody who's elderly. Um, lots of different things, and they're very purposefully written so that to bring out these issues so that people will talk about them. You know, we try to talk about things that are hard. Um, and you get different responses depending on people's, either their level of experience or maybe it might even be based on what they're used to have happening in their particular region of the state. For example, um, for, let's say a person's elderly, mm -hmm. has uh, Alzheimer's, Team 2 is called in, that's it, because for example, uh, we've had family members ourselves that with Alzheimer's, you know, they throw things, they they yell, they scream, and you try to bring that situation down. How do you how how would you deal, or how would Team Two deal with a situation in that well, case? Uh, if there, you know, it, um, whether or it's, if a person's throwing things, yeah, they're throwing things. So there's. One is, uh, can, we, can we at least isolate the person? In other words, get other people out of harm's way uh, might be the first approach. And, you know, um, and then from there, just trying to establish that, that, that human rapport mm -hmm. as best we can. Yeah. Um, finding out why the person, you know, and sometimes they can't articulate why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and, and, and again, every, each of those cases are different. But the first thing is, we need to make sure that nobody else gets hurt. Yeah, um, and, that's the big thing. Yeah, and it sometimes can be simple as uh, if there's other uh, members of the family you know, that could be in that harm's way or other like roommates, um, you know, just like, hey, have them get out of that environment so at least we know that they're safe. Mm -hmm. And now we're just dealing with the one person that is, um, you know, acting the way they are. Um, and so. And you, you picked a, a situation that doesn't fall neatly into the law either because right. it doesn't it doesn't uh, Alzheimer's <coughs> is not considered a major mental illness oh. um, so there's a few I apologize about no 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 no, but it's no it's a good point to bring up because it's can be really frustrating for family members who don't know that like I just want you to you know this guy needs to be in the hospitals but we can't just write uh, commitment papers on a person just if all they're presenting with is Alzheimer's um, people on the autism spectrum also don't fall necessarily into that law. Mm -hmm. um, people with a traumatic Alzheimer's, brain injury, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, people with dementia. So there's a few folks that we're going to have to be pretty creative to figure out how to how to best help them and to keep the community safe. And that's a real and a really important piece too with these hard these hard cases that don't fit squarely in a box. We still get the calls, yeah. the police. Mm -hmm. You know, the dispatchers are still on the phone with, with a family member or you know, whomever's, whoever's making that call. And we still have to show up and do what we can to make sure that everybody's gonna be okay. I mean, at the end of the day, that's why we do what we do, making sure people are okay. Mm -hmm. And and that's what's so hard, because sometimes the officers, what are, geez, what what, what can we do? Yeah, Who do we call um, as we're working through that? And sometimes, like with dementia patients and Alzheimer's, can be absolutely uh, frightening to, to, to people that- Especially when someone's throwing things up there. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. agitated. Ag yeah. Yeah. agitated. Yeah, and and, uh, and and it's uh, and it's really really hard too when it's like a family member that's not even, you know, fully aware of maybe what their actions are, what their actions are. Mm -hmm. um, number and where people can turn to for Team Two. Uh, well, Team Two has 
uh, it, the grant is administered by the Vermont Care Partners, uh -huh. so it's their website <coughs> has all kinds of information about it. Okay. We have a Facebook page um, where, but it's uh, the trainings themselves are not open to the public. Okay, they're, they're really limited to an audience that's invited. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's that. But if people want more information, there um, there's a general Team Two email, mm -hmm. uh, which is Team Two Vermont at Gmail dot com. Okay. Wel I welcome questions. Well, uh, anything else you want to say about Team Two before we end? Uh, no, I just future goals. It's real well, important. future goals. It's uh, the good thing is is uh, it's an ongoing goal. Is to keep making sure that all you know as best we can that as many, if not, I think the goal is all police officers and all, um, are trained. The other ch real big challenge: making sure we have capacity statewide on the with the designated agencies, with the screeners and, and the clinicians out there throughout the throughout Vermont, that they have the resources so they can respond, uh, you know, with law enforcement uh, or with police now when they need with, to. Now, uh, Team Two, um, does it all have to do? Because because you mentioned that it was a grant funded program, mm -hmm. so it, it, does it all have to do with money per se or? You mean whether it continues? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. yes. And when I say grant funded, I mean that it's funded by the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety jointly. And it's a relatively low cost program given sort of you get a lot of bang for your buck, I think, is the way I like to think about it because it, it really doesn't cost a lot to put, the pro put it on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the value that we found in being able to reach this group of people and the, I just can't say enough about the the collaborative nature of the training itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very purposefully laid out, um, and I have a great group of instructors from around the state and each of those regions that, so people are getting trained by their peers, by law enforcement officers. I have a couple of dispatchers who are trainers and a lot of mental health uh, crisis clinicians who are trainers. Mm -hmm. And they got trained back in that, in 2013, as, as the chief mentioned, in, during the Train the Trainers um, sessions that we did around the state. So we have a real good core group of about 35 or so instructors um, for each of those five regions. Well, we would like to thank you for joining us again. Yes, on, thanks. On thank you for having us. us. Yep. Um, again, we would like to thank our uh, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services for um, sponsoring us on Able Dead On Air. This puts an end to this edition of Able Dead On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler again. Arlene uh, could not be here today. Thank you for joining us. See you next time um, on um, on this on the next edition of Able Dead on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Support for Able to Learn Air. Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Major support also includes Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together.